Uh, again, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, webinar. And of course, it's a particular pleasure uh, to welcome Taoiseach Michal Martin. Uh, in a few moments, I'll invite the Taoiseach to formally launch uh, the new ESRI research report. Uh, this is comparing the education and training system to North and South. Uh, but first, I just want to take a, a few brief moments, uh, if I might, to talk about the research collaboration between the ESRI and the Shared Island Unit uh, of the Taoiseach's department, uh, under which uh, the research that we'll be talking about today has, uh, has been undertaken. So uh, going back a little bit, uh, back into pandemic times, it was in, in the autumn of 2020 uh, that the colleagues in the Shared Island Unit first contacted me uh, to explore how we might put together a research programme which supported the, the goals of the Shared I, uh, Island Unit, but was, was also aligned with the, the expertise and the interests of the ESRI. And in truth, certainly from an ESRI perspective, uh, it was relatively easy uh, and straightforward to de design the programme. And I just want to explain why that was the case. And there were sort of essentially three main reasons uh, why it, it, it was uh, easy, as a relatively easy at least, to, to put the research programme together. So the first thing to say is that the Institute has always had an interest in uh, all island issues, and we really see these issues as being integral to the overall research agenda uh, of the ESRI. And I mean, some of this interest can actually be traced back to the founder, Ken Whitaker. And so the Taoiseach, as a, as a historian, will be familiar with the role that Whitaker played in building North-South links uh, in the time of predecessors, uh, Lamas and Lynch. And that interest was essentially transferred into the, uh, the ESRI, and that sort of goes back to the 60s and the 70s. But later, Sir George Quigley, uh, who was a very prominent advocate of North-South cooperation, he was the chair of the ESRI Council for a period. And again, he urged ESRI research to remain engaged on North-South issues. In fact, I think that, you know, which, uh, Quigley was chair in the early 90s when I uh, joined the Institute. I think some of the first time that I really became aware of the sort of North-South agenda uh, was during the period of, of George Quigley. So currently we're also undertaking work um, with the National Institute for Economic and Social Research in London, that's our sister institute in the UK, um, and we're sort of broadening our, our work in, the, in this area there. We're modelling the economy of Northern Ireland and its links with uh, Ireland and Great Britain. And of course, for many years, we've done work with Intertrade Ireland. Uh, so through the, the, the various strands, there really is a sort of a very active uh, body of work being undertaken on North-South issues and, and Northern Ireland within the institution. So the second reason I, I want to mention for why, why we were very enthusiastic about this research program, this, this, this slightly nerdier, uh, if I can put it like that, but I, I know you'll all forgive me uh, for, for dwelling on, on a nerdy issue for a moment. So we live on an island with two populations who share many characteristics, but we have two systems on the island across many facets of life, health, education, social welfare, taxation, you know, really extensive lists. And that's a remarkable setting for researchers to explore how different systems lead to different results. So researchers across Europe have exploited differences across countries for similar purposes, and researchers in the United States uh, have often exploited state level variation in various systems, again, to do their research. So the research opportunities that is created on the island of Ireland are really uh, quite remarkable. And today's report, uh, where we're comparing the education systems, that, that's very much in that sort of mode. So a third reason then, and this is the, the third of my three reasons uh, for the ESRI embracing this research program, stems from the fact that we don't do research as an end in itself. Okay, we do research to provide evidence for better policy with the ultimate goal of improving lives. And I think the philosophy behind the Shared Island Unit, uh, at least as I have always interpreted, it's to enhance cooperation and collaboration on this small island in an effort to benefit the citizens, regardless of their political uh, persuasion. And it's an honor for us uh, to be involved in generating research, which hopefully uh, can inform policy on the island. So increasingly, we see our work in the Institute is going beyond producing reports, and we now aim to disseminate our work through webinars such as this and through discussions with a wider group of stakeholders. And earlier webinars uh, under this program, it's been a pleasure to hear commentary on our work uh, from colleagues based in Ulster University, Queen's and the British Medical Association in Northern Ireland. Uh, today, we have another uh, excellent panel of discussants uh, who I'll introduce later, uh, but we do hope to plan, or we do, do sort of hope to hold additional sessions um, around the research reports, because I think the, the generation of discussion is another sort of goal that share between ourselves and uh, the Shared Island Unit. So before inviting the Taoiseach to address us, I just want to say a few thank yous. 
So I want to begin by thanking Angela Donoghue, Owen Duffy and the colleagues in the Taoiseach's department who've been working with us on the programme and who are essentially providing us with this great opportunity to build up the, uh, the work on all island issues. So it's been a great pleasure to work with them and we look forward to uh, continuing to work um, for a while. Uh, I also want to thank Anne Barrington, who chairs the steering committee, uh, which oversees the work um, with the the, the, the overall work program. Again, the, uh, it's, it's a very important role to have a sort of a governance structure around these sort of uh, programs uh, to make sure that, that everything is done and delivered very, very well. And again, thanks to Anne Barrington for doing that. Uh, it's always a, a pleasure for me at these sort of events to thank the authors of the report. So I want to thank my colleagues, Emma Smith, and Devlin, Adele Burke, and, and Seamus McGuinness uh, for producing an absolutely fantastic report, uh, which we're going to hear uh, obviously more about later. Uh, but uh, I, I can say in advance that it's just a fantastic piece of work and uh, it is going to, I think, sort of stand the test of time. Uh, and finally, I, of course, I want to thank the Taoiseach uh, for joining us today, uh, but also engaging very constructively with earlier reports from the Institute uh, uh, for the Shared Island Unit. Uh, the pleasure of having a couple of brief conversations with the Taoiseach earlier in the programme. And um, I, I, I know he's really sort of in, engaged and be very interested in what we're uh, doing. And uh, that, that's been, uh, again, very sort of rewarding for us. So with that, it's a pleasure for me to ask the Taoiseach to address us and then to formally launch this report, a North-South Comparison of Education and Training Systems, Lessons for Policy. So Taoiseach. Um, thank you very much indeed, Alan, uh, and I appreciate uh, your remarks um, and, and insightful comments in terms of DSRI's um, history and journey um, in, in, in this field. Um, and I want to warmly welcome uh, this groundbreaking report uh, by the Economic and Social Research Institute on Education Systems and Outcomes on the Island of Ireland, commissioned under the research partnership with my department's um, Shared Island Unit. This wide-ranging research programme has already published uh, three significant reports in recent months, analysing the structure and collaborative potential of the services economy, foreign direct investment, and of primary healthcare systems, all on an island-wide basis. And work is underway to be published later this year on renewable energy, productivity, and looking at the migrant integration and early years experience and policy north and south. This partnership with the ESRI is a major part of my department's shared island research program, through which we are providing a base of impartial evidence and analysis about the island of Ireland as part of the government's shared island initiative. The government wants to see this research inform policy, planning, political debate and agreed actions on how we work for a more equitable, connected and prosperous shared island in the years immediately ahead, underpinned by the Good Friday Agreement. Today's report, remarkably, is the first ever systematic examination of education systems north and south from primary through to tertiary levels. So, the research is addressing a real gap in the evidence and understanding we have on how our different education systems serve students, families and communities, how we could learn from each other north and south on education delivery and reform, and how we can do more together to enhance educational experience and outcomes for all. I believe these must be central concerns for our work through the Good Friday Agreement in the time ahead. Education is our bedrock as individuals and as a society. It is the great enabler. And in terms of the peace process, the prospects, experiences, and the perspectives that higher level levels of education afford are pivotal, are pivotal sorry, in enabling better mutual understanding across different communities and political traditions, north and south. The Chinese thinker uh, Confucius wrote long, a long time ago, he wrote, education breeds confidence, confidence breeds hope, hope breeds peace. It is no less true today in this part of the world. Education, quite clearly, is fundamental to how we will make the journey of reconciliation together on this island. And we have a strong basis for working to that end through the framework of the Good Friday Agreement. Via the North-South Ministerial Council, both administrations can cooperate on a range of education concerns, including on disadvantage, special needs, and teacher education. The British Irish Council also includes a work sector on early years. 
through the Peace Plus program, the European Union, United Kingdom government, Irish government, and the executive will provide very significant funding over the next seven years to support shared education and skills initiatives across the island. And higher and further education institutions, North and South, are keen to strategically deepen their cooperation in the years ahead with support from both administrations. Today's ESRI research provides compelling evidence and analysis on why we need to get the most out of all of these channels of cooperation and where we need to focus that work. There will be much to consider and discuss from this research. This morning, I'd like to offer three initial reflections uh, for the government. First, there is a need and a rationale to step up all island cooperation on tackling educational underachievement. Today's ESRI report sets out clearly that unfortunately, overall education achievement and school completion rates in Northern Ireland lag behind both the rest of the United Kingdom and Ireland, as does the impact of efforts in recent years to support education attainment in disadvantaged communities. In the South, while there's no room for complacency, our DESH and school completion programs have achieved important, sustained improvements over the last decade. I know that this position is a serious concern for political and community leaders and for all involved in education in Northern Ireland. The executive has rightly put a focus on addressing it. Last year, agreeing to take forward the recommendations of the Fair Start Report of the Expert Panel on Educational Underachievement. I've long made the case for both governments as co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement to do more to support the executive in this area. The unique community context and legacy in Northern Ireland does mean that education reform and meeting the needs of marginalised communities is more complex. But it also means that the role of education in enabling individual and community progress and well-being is all the more important. Clearly, the government here doesn't have all the answers. But as a partner for the executive, we do have a uniquely comparable scale and structure of education, deep professional and society connections, and a strong tradition of cooperation in the sector. And together with the United Kingdom government, the Irish government has a sincere concern as a co-guarantor of the agreement to see that every young person in Northern Ireland has access to the best possible educational opportunity. And that is why the government would seek to work with the executive and the United Kingdom government to enhance our cooperation and support on educational and attainment issues in Northern Ireland in the time ahead. It is an important part of how we can work together for a shared future on this island for all. A second takeaway from today's research is the scope there is for new and exciting collaboration on further and higher education and training. We are at a point of significant reform and reflection in this area, both North and South. In this jurisdiction, the government is introducing the most radical changes to the leaving certificate exams in half a century and is delivering a genuine step change in higher education through the creation of technological universities. And in further education, we're also targeting increased investment. The focus of our reforms and our investment is to empower every person to reach their full potential. And in Northern Ireland, the executive has commenced an independent review of education at all levels and recently launched a new skills strategy. Today's ESRI report elaborates the comparable context, challenges, and interests in both jurisdictions in providing more pathways to higher levels of education that are attuned both to the needs of students and to current and future skills demands and opportunities. There is real potential both for learning and exchange, north and south, and also cooperation to jointly do new things. For instance, the stakeholder consultation in today's research identified broad interest in looking at an all-island approach to apprenticeships. To take more account of the significant training, employment and business opportunities on a cross-border basis for established trades and newer skills like advanced manufacturing. A cross-border apprenticeship program is already a commitment under the government's action plan for apprenticeships that we want to progress with the executive. And through Peace Plus, we will work with the executive 
to deliver a wide-ranging skills development program, including to support the delivery of cross-border courses by further and higher education institutions. The government also wants to support more student mobility at all levels of education, both on this island and between Ireland and Britain. And this is being examined by our Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovation and Science. New and exciting collaborations are already happening. Through our shared island fund, the government has already delivered a major new 40 million north-south research program, which is now underway, bringing together researchers and third level institutions to engage in collaborative work that will strengthen the island's reputation for innovation and research excellence. And we want to move ahead this year with the executive and the United Kingdom government to establish new all island research hubs supporting through the Shared Island Fund and by Science Foundation Ireland to bring industry, research agencies and institutions together to conduct world leading R&D in areas of common priority for both jurisdictions. Enhancing our collective FDI offering an indigenous enterprise base and supporting good jobs in towns and cities across this island. A third reflection on today's report is on the views from stakeholders on how in real terms we can build up more ambitious, impactful all island cooperation in the education sector. There is interest in the sector in getting beyond ad hoc, intermittent or project specific approaches to more strategic interaction on the big shared concerns, like tackling educational disadvantage and meeting special education needs. This also came through strongly in a shared island dialogue event on education that the government had convened last October with more than 130 education and civil society leaders. Achieving that more strategic, impactful cooperation to benefit all communities on this island is a core objective of the government's shared island initiative. Today's research concludes, in my view, quite rightly, that simply mandating cross-border cooperation won't work. It suggests an emphasis on ways that facilitate cooperation in a mutually beneficial and self-reinforcing way around areas of mutual interest. The success of the Standing Conference on Teacher Education North-South is highlighted as a model. These are important points to consider further as we seek to build engagement and consensus to deliver our shared island goals on education and indeed in other policy areas. Finally, the research refers to the importance of sustained political buy-in in making progress. This was also a conclusion of the National Economic and Social Council in a report the government published earlier this month on shared island opportunities in a range of areas. And clearly political leadership, by all with a role and responsibility, is fundamental in getting beyond the current issues around Brexit and the protocol. And in returning the focus to supporting progress and prosperity in Northern Ireland and through the North, South and East West dimensions of the Good Friday Agreement. Next week, the people of Northern Ireland will vote to provide a new democratic mandate for the devolved power sharing institutions at Stormont. It is vital for the future of Northern Ireland and for relationships on these islands that the political parties take their mandates from the assembly elections and move quickly to form a new executive. That is what the people of Northern Ireland want. This is a moment for political leaders to live up to the commitments of the Good Friday Agreement, which is overwhelmingly supported by people across this island. And in this context, I am reminded of the words of the then Minister for Education, Don O'Malley, when in a defining moment of leadership, he announced uh, the introduction of free secondary education for all in this jurisdiction in um, 1966. This transformed the prospects of tens of thousands of children. And it was part of the sustained investment in education that has been the cornerstone of the economic and social progress that we've made in the decades since. O'Malley encapsulated the need for urgent, concerted, sustained action by saying simply, and I quote, we will be judged by future generations on what we did for the children of our time, unquote. We need to keep that same clarity of focus and spirit of action in view today and work to take up the full potential of the Good Friday Agreement in education and across all areas of common interest to build a shared, prosperous, inclusive future for all communities 
on this island. And that will remain a guiding focus for the government as a core guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. Thank you very much, uh, Taoiseach. Um, I think I mentioned in my opening remarks uh, how much we appreciated the extent to which the Taoiseach has really engaged uh, with the work of ESRI for the Sherrod Island unit. And um, I think you can clearly take from his remarks there uh, that he's engaged very much uh, with, with, with this report. And uh, telltale signs, Taoiseach, that you're a former Minister for Education as well, uh, that you've been thinking about these issues uh, for a very, very long time. We, we've got a, a few minutes for uh, just, just a, a quick conversation. And if I could begin with, with the following question, uh, focusing on the area of educational disadvantage. Okay, so I think one of the themes of the report is that here in the South, we've had some success, at least through the DASH program, uh, in terms of tackling some of the issues. Now, again, nobody's suggesting for a moment that we've solved all the issues or anything like that, but there does seem to have been very good progress made. And the issue of educational disadvantage in Northern Ireland still seems to be quite acute. Okay, and I'm just wondering from your perspective, like what's the best mechanism to get the lessons from the South into the North? And I say that in the context that, I mean, I know you, you as Taoiseach do not want to be seen to be lecturing Northern Ireland on how to do things. Uh, so there's sort of various layers. Is it at executive, ministerial level, official level? Is it more a sort of a civil society uh, type engagement? You know, how, how do we at a practical level get the, the, the positive lessons from the South uh, implemented in the North in that spirit of cooperation? I think it's it's at all levels, um, and I think what 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 and I mean this would be I suppose part of my own personal story in life in the sense that I am part of that sixties uh, revolution and that we would have been the first in our family to get second level education. So it's something I would sort of have a personal kind of issue with that every child should get the opportunity to complete school and get you know make get equality of opportunity in life. So it's as fundamental as that, and I became a school teacher before I came into politics and would have engaged with children uh, whose futures would have been different if they didn't complete um, schooling. Um, and, and so that's a personal thing for me. And then in terms of my interest in Northern Ireland, um, I, I engage with educationists a lot and um, people in third level and all levels. And it's, it's an ongoing concern uh, that quite a significant number of children on the island uh, don't get those opportunities. And so, the first level I'd work on is that research piece and um, that research, the educational research base, in other words, the Drumcondor Research Centre, it's parallel in the north. Um, we need that kind of ongoing collaboration uh, because we're always evolving new methods, okay, uh, you know, new approaches, new ways of improving outcomes and so on. So I think that's very important. Um, and also then at the practitioner level, in terms of uh, teachers evaluating what has happened in both jurisdictions in terms of educational programs and outcomes. Um, and, and the more we get the system, if you like, or the, the ecosystem of education on the island working hand in glove, um, I think out of that then would come the opportunity to persuade the political leaders on all sides um, to take political decisions to um, allocate the resources that will be required um, to, um, you know, focus in on those disadvantaged communities and provide the additional supports. And it's not just about financial supports and additional teacher supports, it's also about know-how and the type of programs and the curriculum that underpins that uh, to enable a successful journey through school for, for, for children in, in particular communities. So mm. uh, I, I think there's one message I would say, this is a long haul project. In, in the sense that there are no quick wins. We've learned that in the Republic. As you say, we're by no means complacent. We have a lot to do. And in fact, I'm engaging with inner city community or different communities across Dublin in the last six months where you can get regression. If certain things happen in certain communities and certain people get control of those communities, um, one can get regression in terms of participation in, in education, uh, performance and so forth. So one of the lessons I've learned politically is we can sort of invest for 10 years in an area and then sort of say to ourselves, we think that's grand on that area and then pull the rug from under the area and you, you regress again. And um, so the, the supports, I think we have to convince everybody in political leadership, don't expect immediate magical results, 
uh, this is a long haul journey, uh, but it does bring results over a time frame. And um, I've seen a big change in this jurisdiction from the late 90s to where we are today in terms of school completion. But the journey isn't complete. Yeah. And I, I'm going to jump, unfortunately, uh, lots of themes there that we'd like to explore further. But but to jump to the other end of the sort of the educational spectrum into um, third level, uh, I guess one of the sort of exciting developments over the last year in the Republic has been the creation of the technical universities. And I think what's been interesting about them is the notion that you have these sort of multi-campus type situations uh, which are brought together. And so they, they look sort of geographically spread. But I suppose it leads to the obvious question, and I'm just wondering, would this sort of be part of your vision? Can you imagine a, a north-south university? Yes, I can. And would you be enthusiastic? Um, well, we have a week to go before an election. I don't want to cause any. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's obvious. Um, I, I believe Letter Kenny uh, with us to university um, is one we could look at. I know that kind of counteracts what we've just done there in terms of the Atlantic Technological University, but I can actually, uh, and it could be something else completely different. I mean, I don't want to be pre preempt pre that, but of course, because what's interesting in the technological universities and how they've evolved, not only are they multi, you know, campus in the sense that you have three colleges coming together or two colleges coming together, like in the Cork, uh, what was the Cork IT in Kerry or in the Southeast, Carlo and, and Waterford, uh, but you have different disciplines. Uh, so like in the Cork Technology University, you've got an art school. Uh, you've got uh, a fantastic school of education, Cork School of Education, and they're enriching the, the broader campus. So the real benefit of the technology universities are they're bringing different experiences that have evolved over time to make a much richer cam 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 campus and experience and opportunities for interdisciplinary work and so on like that. And that's what a North-South university should look like. And um, that somebody is bringing additionality to the table. It's a different type of creature, so to speak, from the conventional. Um, and so one could look at it in a different number. I, I looked at two kind of campuses then. I probably was the wrong way to go about it, but there's other ways to, to, to look at this also. And um, so, I, so I can, yes. OK, uh, Terry Scott, um, Terry is with us from uh, Ulster University. Did, did you want to have just a, it'll have you a very quick intervention, but you, but you've lived North South education, so we'll, we'll let you in very quickly. Indeed. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Tishak, uh, for, for your comments. Um, I do think that you know, the point that you've made in terms of it's not an overnight uh, fix I mean, the technological universities from you know, the higher education strategy in uh, 2011 to finding you know, it's almost 10 years in terms of development. The, the work that Ulster University is doing with uh, uh, Letterkenny and Sligo, I'm going to speak shortly about and give some of the insight yep. to, to the learning. So it is about having a vehicle and having a, a need. So where the need for, for example, we have a program with Sligo now Atlantic Technological University where Ulster deliver a, a joint uh, biomedical science degree. So you're taking the best and the skills from both and delivering needs for people in the region. So you're upskilling people in the region, you're keeping people in the region and you're adding value. And importantly, you're able to do it with an economic model that is viable and sustainable. So you know, there's a number of examples, including the masters that we do with Letter Kenny uh, in Ulster, which meets a need. And I think it's important in the context of cross-border apprenticeship, because there is a real need for skills in, in areas and there's an opportunity for us to really take the momentum and the demand from business and industry for skills to open access to opportunity to higher education through higher level apprenticeships. So this morning, there's a, you know, this is addressed in the, in the report. So your comments are particularly welcome. And I uh, think you're, you're knocking at an open door in terms of support for business, in terms of support from the universities, in particular Ulster University. So thank you for your comments. Uh, and just to say on that, um, Terry, if I may, that I was up in Ulster recently um, and we discussed LIGO as well as that I kind of think um, the, Ulster were very keen on that collaboration also. We're prepared through Shared Island uh, funding to underpin some of these initiatives uh, that would emanate from Ulster University uh, and to fund certainly capital elements of that. 
and to to cement those connections and to give them a, a, a good start if you like you know you've already initiated some exciting interventions there and you're quite right on, on apprenticeships and trades and so on like that and those skills area because all the companies coming into the island now and Alan you might know this but um, the number one thing they're saying to me is the skills talent uh, can you get them in and um, and they're actually saying so far Ireland still is, has a defined advantage I don't want to go into other issues the Republic being in the EU is helpful because it's an open talent base and they say that so the talent is the number one not actually tax as much well, tax is still there don't get me wrong but talent is the key enabler for the companies now uh, for that area and uh, thank you now un unfortunately i'm under strict instructions uh, to release you uh, by by 10 30 i know you've got another engagement and uh, your your department will never uh, allow it you can take another one Alan, if you wish yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good uh, and you can and you can blame me you know uh, sorry yeah, so <laughs> well do, do, do you want to actually do you want to take one more if you could take yeah one take more one question. more yeah I, i'm going before the good friday ireland uh, parliamentary committee now that's where i'm going on before the, the year off this but i'll take one more question if you wish. okay take one more uh, and uh, well, well this is good anyway because let, let, let's go for apprenticeships uh for, for a second that I, that I know comes up but every time we discuss apprenticeships uh in, in these sort of um fora th there's also people talk positively about it okay but we know that there seems to be this sort of um, second class status almost around further education compared to higher. And I always think it's, it's almost like a cultural thing. Uh, and it's almost like, um, you know, we, we as a nation, I don't know, it was the parents of the nation are so eager for their kids to go into um, higher education rather than further. There's a sort of a disconnect in some ways between the policy discussion with what seems to be happening almost around family tables. Um, and I, I'd be just curious about your, your own reflection uh, on, on that issue. Um, I, I'm sure there's an arts out dimension in it too, in the sense that I, I, you know, I think the expectations um, you know, across the two jurisdictions are such that there is this sort of disconnect. But just from your own perspective, how, how, how do we push apprenticeships and further education, you know, I give them a sort of a, a stronger gloss or whatever? Well, I think you're absolutely correct. It's cultural, I think, and probably is a factor of our generation. When I said that that 60s, 70s generation and this strive for education and it kind of got got very kind of focused on it has to be the following. Um, if we, we must emulate or we must get to university or must get to uh, the technological university. So, but that's changing over time. I think what's very important is progression pathways um, and that we put the learner at the center. So that you say to a person, um, you, you do, and this, this, again, this might be, I might be guilty of the same cultural thing, but, but basically, the apprenticeship is a pathway to other things too, if you wish. Uh, and an institutional snobbery has to be eradicated, eliminated. So therefore, you do your apprenticeship. There's no, nothing stopping you from going on to do other things as well after. And that's the way I think the qualifications framework that we have here now with the fee tech, he tech, and all of that is an important. But that was an important revolution. Um, a long time ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago, which has actually, uh, over time, created that pathway that it doesn't have to be all or everything at the end of the leaving cert. That's important. I also think the one of the reasons, and, and Terry was saying, what the evolution of technological universities, I mean, they go back further. I mean, the, the establishment of regional technical colleges in the Republic was a radical move. I think Paddy Hillary was a key figure in that. But that connected the regions economically with education in a way that sometimes universities did not do. And so that whole, if you look at that pharmaceutical uh, thing in the, in, the, in the South and, and uh, all of that, the regional technical college, what was the Cork Regional Technical College, was key to that industry in terms of engineering, instrumentation, and so on like that, and apprenticeships. Point I'm making is, the minute you get a university tag doesn't mean you shouldn't be providing education or, or sorry apprenticeship platforms um, and there is there is that institutional thing that we want to walk the ladder and that means we have to jettison things we were doing very well historically like dit was excellent on apprenticeships is very good on apprenticeships cork is these used to be badges of honor and they would win international gold medals um, and i recall going to many colleges around the country third level colleges it was a badge of honor other people got notions then and said, look, if we really want to be a degree awarding uh, institution, we can't have apprenticeships, you know, and there was an element of that, and that's the cultural thing, and we have to really bury that 
You know, the Germans are much better at it. I think they celebrate the broad range of skill sets than we do. And we just have to really get over ourselves. Um, oh, by the way, um, bricklaying is probably one of the more remunerative professions at the moment, oh, I can tell you. Well, so, no, well, absolutely. And actually, I mean, not to extend this too far, but in the, in the whole area of climate change and retrofitting and all those sort of things, there is such a crying uh, need. And it's not just uh, even at the individual, there is a, a societal and a global level. Uh, to use your phrase, we need to get over ourselves uh, if we're going to have a positive impact in this area. So, um, yeah, no, huge, huge number of issues. Anyway, listen, Tishak, thanks, thanks again. Uh, I, I, so no, I'm, I'm not going to exploit you any further because uh, you may not be afraid of your officials, but I am. Uh, so I don't, don't want to, with, to overdo it. With, with, with good reason, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you said it. Listen, thanks so much again. I really, really appreciated your, uh, your participation. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again before too long. But anyway, have Thank a good morning, Tishak. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, with that then, there's one of these situations we've talked about uh, the report, uh, so it's probably high, high time that somebody uh, talked more directly to it. Uh, so at, the, at this point in the morning, anyway, it's my pleasure uh, to invite uh, two colleagues who are going to take you through the details of the report, uh, Anne Devlin and Emer Smith. And uh, I was very conscious to ask you both who was going to start. I think it's Anne. And did yeah. I get that wrong? Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, no, so. I'm sorry. Okay, so Anne um, will uh, take you through a certain distance and then Emer will take over from there. And can I say to people, um, if you want to sort of make comments whereby people can engage, feel free to use the chat function. Uh, but if you want to use the Q&A function uh, for questions, so uh, later on in the morning, um, we'll uh, hopefully have some time for Q&A uh, that you might want to direct questions to the uh, the author. So if you use the Q&A function for, for questions, uh, chat function for more general uh, commentary, that would be great. So with that, Anne, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Al. And um, so as Alan said, I'm Anne Devlin and Emer and I are going to go through the key findings. Um, we can see that, okay, I'm sharing the right screen, yeah? Yeah, all go down. Perfect. <laughs> it's hard to know when you get three. And um, so we're going to take you through the key findings today and just really quickly before we start, but Alan touched on this, we just want to acknowledge the support we've got for this um, from the Shared Island Unit with the Department of the Taoiseach. The research program steering group and um, Professor Tony Gallagher from Queen's, who was an advisor to the study, and most importantly, the stakeholders who we interviewed and also took part in a consultation late last year, who really were so keen to get involved and positive about the project and happy to share their um, opinions and their views, which was great and really added to the work we're doing here. Um, so as we know, this is the first systematic review of the education systems in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, we take a mixed methods approach, so I'm going to take you through some data analysis. Um, we're looking at educational attainment, skills development in both jurisdictions. Um, as Alan and the Taoiseach mentioned, we look at social disadvantage and how that relates to attainment in both jurisdictions. And then I'm going to finish off looking at wage premiums and the returns to the qualifications that we're seeing. And then I'll hand over to Emer, and she's going to go through the differences and the commonalities and the key themes that we got when we were talking to the stakeholders um, and then she'll finish up with some conclusions and some of the policy implications that we think may come from our work over time. Um, so if we start by looking at the educational attainment over time, so this is using the EU LFS um, survey. So this is looking from 2005 to 2019. So what we have here is a low attainment and a high attainment. I sort of left out medium because it's pretty similar between the jurisdictions and it doesn't really change much in this time period. Um, but as we'd expect from 2005, we're really seeing low levels of educational attainment. So that's primary and lower secondary falling over time in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And at the other end of the spectrum, we're seeing levels of high attainment. So that's degrees and above are increasing up to 2019. Um, so we sort of look at the same thing then, but we look at this with a restricted age cohort. So we're looking just at those 25 to 34. Um, and the reason we do this is to get a better gauge of what's coming out of the education systems more recently, so how they're performing in more recent times. And as you'd expect, we see the same patterns exist. High attainment's increasing from 20, 2005 to 2019, and low attainment has fallen. Um, what we did note here was low attainment in Ireland seems to be falling to a greater degree. Um, in Northern Ireland, it's fluctuating in and around that 20% over this 15 year period, whereas in Ireland, it's really sort of um, 
diverging and getting less and less over time. It's going there from about 18% in 2005 down to, I think it was 7 or 8% in 2019. Um, so quite a good improvement there in terms of a lower proportion of the population or of that age population with these low levels. Um, so that LFS data breaks education down into three categories. We can also look at it using PIAC data and it's good because it gives us education by five categories. So it splits it out further. But we see, um, we see the same trend, the same things happening here. There's much higher levels of a primary or below educational attainment in Northern Ireland compared to Ireland. Um, we actually had really, really similar levels of degrees. So um, I think this is just under 20% for both. But we do see this big difference in the post-secondary non-tertiary qualifications. Um, so that sort of upper secondary finishes A level in Northern Ireland. So this is um, further education sort of courses. And in the South, this is particularly driven by the post leaving certificate qualifications. So this level of attainment is three times as high in Ireland as um, is the case in Northern Ireland, which we thought was a huge difference. And then we do the same thing again. We look at this PIAC data for 25 to 29 year olds and it's consistent throughout. Um, here, I, if I remember correctly, it's about 12% of people in Northern Ireland, 25 to 29, with a primary or below education, and it's only 2% in Ireland. So they've really improved in recent years in terms of pushing people on to reach medium or to at least reach lower secondary and then into upper secondary levels. And these improvements just haven't been mirrored in the North to the same extent. Um, and again, the proportion of people with a post-secondary qualification is about three times as high. I think it was 36% and 11% um, for this age group. Um, and another way of looking at the educational outcomes for both is we look at early school leaving. So this is a really particular, particularly negative form of educational failure. Um, it's just it's known to have really long-term impacts on people in terms of job opportunities, job or job quality, sort of security of the work. It might be in precarious work. Um, and also in wage progression over the life course. So it's really long-term impacts for people who are early school leavers. And um, so we can measure early school leaving by various defini definitions. And if we look at this final one here, this is commonly used by the OECD. And the definition here is people who are 16 to 24 and they're not in education and they have at most a lower secondary um, qualification. And it's more well over two times as high in Northern Ireland than it is in Ireland. And we look at these other definitions, it's consistently much, much higher in the North um, than is the case in Ireland. So we go on then and we look at skills development. So we move away from the educational qualifications and we have international standardised assessments, which allow us to look at skills both in primary schools. So we're looking here primary school so children are about age nine and we can also look at secondary school when they're about um, 15 years of age. What was interesting here is Ireland and Northern Ireland both perform really 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 highly in these scores on an international level you know they're really high performing regions and at age nine in terms of reading and maths we see no statistical difference between the two countries so between Ireland and Northern Ireland and what we've plotted here is the scores um, against parental education. So it's sort of a proxy for social disadvantage. And at this stage, we're seeing similar inequality levels across the jurisdictions. Um, things change a wee bit then when we move on to secondary level. So again, both really high performing. Um, on average, the scores in these tests are slightly higher in Ireland than Northern Ireland, but not much. And then we do find that there's actually more differentiation by social disadvantage in Ireland at these skills levels compared to Northern Ireland. Because you can see there, the red lines are much flatter than the blue line for Ireland. So social inequality seems to be a bigger driver of skills levels in Ireland um, at this age. So a bit, we can see shifts starting to happen between ages nine and 10 and up then to age 15. Um, so if we continue then looking at social disadvantage, we go back to looking to how this interacts with these education levels. So we're looking here at early school leaving at about attaining a primary level, so a low level of education. And we also look at the probability of being neat. So that's being not in education, employment or training. Um, we can interpret these marginal effects. So for this first column, children in Northern Ireland are 19 percentage points more likely to be neat um, than their peers whose parents have higher levels of education. 
and in Ireland this is 18 percentage points. So they're pretty similar here. But then as we move across these, um, the effect of your parents having a low education is twice as high in Northern Ireland as the effect in Ireland. Um, if we go back to early school leaving, and this goes back to using that OECD definition that I explained, um, children in Northern Ireland whose parents have a low level of education are nearly 27 percentage points more likely to be early school leavers than their peers whose parents have higher levels of education. So it's a really, really, really big impact social disadvantage is having here. Um, so that's sort of going against what I said in the previous slide, the social disadvantage is more important in Ireland, but we'll talk now about exam performance and we started to get to the bottom of this and explain what was happening. Um, so we know, so we've looked now at education levels and educational attainment. We know that over and above these levels of education, the grades people get plays a role in terms of access to HE. You need your certain points or your certain grades to get into your um, course of choice at university and also in terms of employment. So in both systems, as we would have anticipated, exam grades at both lower and up and dairy sec upper secondary differ by gender and by social disadvantage. And the lowest performance is seen amongst um, disadvantaged males. So this reiterates what's seen generally in the literature and has been found in both jurisdictions before. Um, we did find then, however, that the relative gap is larger and the relationship between disadvantage and upper secondary exam performance is much stronger in Ireland than in Northern Ireland. So we're sort of getting these mixed results. But then as we thought about it, in Northern Ireland, social disadvantage is having an effect at the level of the education you'll reach. So you're not reaching upper secondary. And that's why we see these high levels of early school leaving. In Ireland, social disadvantage isn't having an impact until later. So most children are staying in school until upper secondary and finishing the leaving cert. And then because the majority is there, social disadvantage is playing out in terms of a wider variation in the grades that students are getting um, at the end of their upper secondary qualifications. Um, we also looked at the social background and educational expectations of children. And um, so we're able to do this through the PISA study. Expectations to go on to university are vary by maternal education in both settings. So both jurisdictions, if your parents have higher levels of education, you see yourself as more likely to go on to uni. Um, Across the board, however, expectations were much lower in Northern Ireland than in Ireland, even after we controlled for this social background. Um, and we found when we looked into this further, we find it seems to be due to the much, much lower expectations among children in non-grammar schools, so in the controlled secondary schools in the north. Um, and again, particularly low expectations were found amongst males in these schools. Um, expectations in the grammar schools then in the north were found to be no higher than those in the voluntary secondary schools in Ireland. Um, so real differences here in the aspirations children have to go on to higher levels of attainment. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna move over and we are going to look at the returns to education. So what we're looking at here is wage premiums for the various qualifications in each of the jurisdictions. So at this point, we're looking at them separately. And I actually find it addressing that we get quite interesting or quite similar results across them. So a lower secondary qualification in Northern Ireland, you'll earn about 10% more than a peer who just has a primary level education. And that's 11% in Ireland. So really similar. Where we do see this difference coming through is the post-secondary. And if we go back to what I was saying, there's much higher levels of that qualification in Ireland. The wage premium for post-secondary non-tertiary qualification is about 45% in the North and um, compared to only 30% in Ireland. So a really interesting finding and something that probably needs to be looked further into to see what's going on or is there a demand for that qualification in the North? Um, so that's looking at them separately. And as we would expect, there's a strong relationship between education and you're going to earn more. We then looked at them we then pulled the data and looked at them together to see how they all compare. So everything here is the wage premium relative to a primary education in Northern Ireland. Um, so an Irish primary education has a 27% wage premium relative to a Northern Irish, Irish primary education. To get that same wage premium of 27% in Northern Ireland, you would need to get an upper secondary qualification. So we need to be up two levels on that um, educational attainment for the same wage premium as somebody in Ireland is getting. But we can see a really strong relationship here. 
Um, so we put them into a table so we can look at them side by side. And in the right hand column, this is the percentage point difference between the wage premium at each level. Um, and I thought this was interesting. I suppose when we talk, we all know wages are higher in the Republic of Ireland, but we often talk, you know, with there's talk about FDI and technology and certain sectors. So I suppose I sort of was going into this thinking wage premiums will be at the upper end of the qualification spectrum. But we're seeing these um, wage premiums are really, really persistent across the different levels of qualification. Like there's a 29% um, percentage point gap there for lower secondary qualifications. So these wage premiums um, in Ireland relative to Ireland are really, really persistent. Um, I think two things here, again, we see the difference in the post-secondary, which I think points to maybe looking into expanding FE provision. And that's something Emma then will come to when she talks in the qualitative work and the stakeholders. And um, also these large gaps may point to lower levels of productivity productivity in Northern Ireland. And that's something that's getting a lot, lot more coverage here, you know, the last couple of years. And um, it's in the news all the time now about the productivity levels in the Northern Ireland economy. Um, and then, oh, oh sorry. I'm scrolling. And then um, finally, I think these differences in wage premium are really important because um, wage premiums act as an incentive to invest in education. So we've low levels of attainment in Northern Ireland and there's no wage premium to incentivize young people to continue their education, to invest in their education. It might be that this, um, these levels of attainment are gonna be maybe more persistent than might be ideal. Um, so I'll finish up there and hand over to Emer, who will go through the qualitative work. And then I point out all these gaps and hopefully some of the work that Emer's done will maybe start to explain some of that. Thank you, Anne. As Anne said, uh, what we tried to do in the stakeholder interviews was really to probe behind those patterns and to look at what factors were potentially driving them. Now, when we take it kind of up from primary level, we see certain commonalities. Stakeholders in both jurisdictions were broadly positive about primary education, about the around the child centered nature of the curriculum and the skills that were developed, especially in relation to literacy. Both systems have challenges around the predominance of small schools, which causes difficulties or challenges at least around resourcing and around the organization of teaching and learning. In both systems, uh, there are diverse school types, which has implications for the kind of funding they receive and their organization system in terms of management and reporting. Not surprisingly, when you interview uh, stakeholders, funding overall levels of funding was raised as, as an issue in both settings. So stakeholders in Northern Ireland in particular highlighted lower levels of funding per pupil compared to other parts of the UK, with this having uh, significant implications for schools and putting them under pressure in terms of staffing and resources. In Ireland, uh, uh, stakeholders tend to look at to OECD and EU average levels of educational funding and highlighted the gaps between overall funding in Ireland and those other settings. When we move on to look at secondary level, there were also very strong similarities there, particularly in highlighting the shift in focus from primary where things were more child centered to uh, secondary level where there was a stronger emphasis on high stakes examinations. One stakeholder in Northern Ireland said uh, there was a strong skills and knowledge based curriculum in primary level, but then moving on to GCSE, it was very knowledge based. And that assessment at that key stage four didn't sit comfortably with the earlier curriculum and didn't really assess the skills needed for 21st century uh, uh, life and, and, and employment. Another stakeholder in Northern Ireland uh, talked about uh, the system being one of, of spoon feeding uh, students and being an exam factory uh, that if you're drilling for exams, uh, you, you uh, kind of limit the, the skills that young people can develop. And if there was a less pressurized system, you'd have more space to develop rounded individuals. We get similar points made in Ireland, where there is a real issue that uh, we're seen as good at transferring blocks of knowledge, uh, but integrating teaching and learning of skills, 
um, is still a challenge and that the emphasis on a high stakes examination at, at leaving cert level uh, is seen as narrowing the skills and overall development of young people. But there, there were differences too. In particular, as the teacher has, has highlighted, uh, there are differing approaches to educational disadvantage. In both settings, uh, additional funding is given to schools who are serving more socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, but this is done in different ways. Um, in the North, it was seen as, as, as by stakeholders as allocating money without kind of a follow through in terms of uh, accountability. Uh, one stakeholder said, throwing up money at something when you don't track what the money is used for. And they argued that in many schools, it just goes to balance the books. And in other schools, it's used to target the students who need it. Need it. And, and that issue was also highlighted recently by the, the Northern Ireland Audit Office, um, who, who felt it was difficult to evaluate the outcome of this additional funding, uh, given the lack of targeting and lack of uh, evaluation. Uh, in Ireland, in contrast, uh, the DESH program was seen as not just giving extra money, but providing an integrated suite of supports um, that emphasised teacher uh, education, teacher CPD, programmes like reading recovery, and allowing schools certain flexibility to determine what they needed. Both systems share to focus on, on working class groups as a target group for intervention. And in both settings, um, stakeholders highlighted their concerns that the pandemic and uh, the period of school closures had resulted in uh, kind of a deepening of these existing inequalities. One stakeholder said that missing out on school meant they missed out on so many of the other things that keep them going. And that it was apparent that really the pandemic highlighted that schools are more than places of, of education, that they're places of care, places of even providing food uh, uh, to, to young children and to kind of giving them access to social interaction with their peers. Now, obviously, a, a big difference is the structure of secondary education in, in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, in Ireland, we have very considerable uh, level of school choice so around half of the cohort don't attend their nearest or most accessible school and this does result we know on the basis of of previous research in a great differentiation in terms of uh, the social background and ability background of of children in different schools interestingly that wasn't as highlighted as strongly by stakeholders in ireland um, as the concentration of disadvantage at local area level but, but not surprisingly, stakeholders in the North really highlighted the impact of academic selection on outcomes. Uh, you know, uh, there was a real consensus that uh, selection had been causing difficulties and concentrating students from disadvantaged backgrounds in the same schools was producing poor outcome uh, that was resulting in social segregation and the concentration of students with special educational needs. There are issues in, in both settings around vocational options uh, for that kind of 14 to 19 year old age group, but the issues that arose from that were quite different. Um, in Ireland, the, the feeling was, and this has come up in, in, in the NCCA uh, senior cycle reform, consultation and so on, that there's a lack of vocational options for young people with more practical uh, emphasis and that as one stakeholder here says, we could be doing more to prepare young adults for the world of work and for the world of third level by giving them a broader range of skills and moving away from the terminal examination system. In Northern Ireland, the, the argument and the challenge was quite different. Uh, there was a concern about vocational qualification space being crowded and confusing and the need to have very clear pathways for young people uh, to move through the system and the potential that there is duplication of courses in particular areas and not necessarily a kind of the streamlined approach that young people need and uh, you know need in order to kind of make informed decisions about their pathways. 
Now, moving on to further education, um, Anne has already highlighted the differences in, in the numbers, leaving uh, the system with these kinds of qualifications, but there were nonetheless some commonalities. In particular, uh, as Alan and, and the Taoiseach discussed, that the kind of lower status, the perceptions of lower status in relation to FE in the North, it was, felt, it was lack of knowledge, and that really it was young people who needed to come convince their parents because every parent is barred for their child to go to university. Similar issues were uh, kind of brought up by stakeholders in Ireland around awareness of the viability and value of VET options compared to third level routes. And, uh, you know, this has emerged uh, as an important way of highlighting this has been the, the kind of recent decision uh, to include uh, further education options into the central uh, applications office process uh, so that they would be highlighted side by side by third level. Again, as Alan and the Taoiseach uh, discussed, uh, both systems have seen developments in relation to apprenticeships and traineeships, in particular, the broadening of the kinds of areas in which apprenticeships are provided. But there were differences. Uh, one striking difference was around the links or, or lack of them in, in Ireland uh, between schools and FE institutions. So there has been an initiative around area, area learning communities in the north, which has tried to help schools and further education colleges to work together um, so that they're not duplicating provision and so that they give a better offer in tandem to the young person uh, regarding their choices. There are also differences between the systems but within the systems on a, on a regional local level in the connections between further education provision and labour market needs and, and skill requirements. Now, moving on to higher education, as Anne has shown, we see a kind of high level of return to higher education qualifications in both systems. Um, we have seen some new developments around the technological universities as discussed earlier. Uh, and this was seen as uh, having the potential to deepen capacity and to lead to more innovation around technological research. Um, we also see though, variable links between further education and higher education institutions between and within systems. Uh, one stakeholder in Ireland pointed to the need for a more sensible system for pathways that are simplified and more recognizable pathways from further to higher education. Uh, they highlighted how uh, at present, um, there's too much dependence on the individual relationship between institutions rather than this being a systematic uh, a bridge between the two settings. A stakeholder in Northern Ireland uh, pointed to moves to align HE and FE provision at levels four and five, and the university that they were uh, kind of involved in was trying to build a transition system so students didn't have to leave Northern Ireland to study for a degree. And that was a strong contrast between the two settings was that the proportion over a quarter of young people in Northern Ireland who go outside Northern Ireland to attend university um, and a high proportion of those do not return, which has implications for then the pattern of kind of entrance to the labour market and the kind of skills um, that are available for employers. Now, a final issue that we talked about with the stakeholders was around their perceptions of existing North-South links and the potential for future links and collaboration. Uh, they highlighted a number of examples of good practice. As we've heard uh, mentioned already, Scotians was seen as a particularly positive way of bringing together education practitioners, exchanging good practice, conducting uh, North-South research, and it was seen as a really positive model. Uh, there was also really strong evidence of collaboration between these two inspectorates, that there have been a lot of mutual learning and mutual support around particular projects, and that was seen very positively. But then a number of stakeholders felt that often these links were ad, ad hoc, that it was really based on particular individuals pioneering uh, the collaboration or specific, often time delimited initiatives or projects. One stakeholder pointed to kind of some schools that have been very proactive in this area in 
across border linkages. Uh, and these schools had a greater awareness, but it depended on the school being involved in these initiatives. Um, again, they highlighted how it's often because people know each other that they collaborate, but it's not necessarily strategic. And then if the person changes position, that link can be broken. Um, the Northwest was highlighted as a good example um, of existing collaboration, as Professor Scott has pointed to, um, but uh, cooperation was overall seen as very segmented. However, people were broadly positive about the potential for more scope, uh, for more cooperation on substantive issues. Um, one stakeholder felt any collaboration with other jurisdictions is beneficial. Just to hear what happened, you may view things slightly differently yourself. So this idea of policy learning, that looking at other settings can help us better reflect on the challenges in our own systems. And then there was issues around potential efficiency and capacity uh, around kind of university campuses very closely located together and there be potential uh, synergies there in cooperation uh, around provision. So just to conclude what myself and, and Anne have uh, tried to present from a, a, a much larger, richer uh, uh, piece of work. Um, we see quite clear differences in the levels of education uh, attainment North and South. We see much higher rates of early school leaving in Northern Ireland. It's clear that, that DASH and the Related School Completion Programme have contributed to a, a considerable improvement in recent years in Ireland uh, in the rates of early school leaving. And the persistent rates of, of early school leaving in Northern Ireland are of concern because, as, as Anne has highlighted, they have long term impacts for individuals and their employment outcomes, but even more broadly in terms of, of outcomes like health, uh, dependency on welfare and e even crime levels. Interestingly, we see these differences in qualifications despite very similar skill levels among school going children. And we see that both systems do uh, do well in terms of promoting skill levels uh, in terms of it kind of the international landscape. So there's, if you like, a mismatch between skill development and, and qualification attainment in, in Northern Ireland in particular. We see that social disadvantage is a strong predictor of educational outcomes and both your restrictions, but it plays out differently in the two settings. In Northern Ireland, it's reflected in early leaving. In Ireland, we see that young people stay on to leaving cert level, but then there's quite a, a, a inequality in the grades they receive, uh, and this has consequences for their later outcomes too. We see that stakeholders highlight similarities and differences between the two systems. And if you could just move on, yeah, thanks. Um, and we see common concerns about how well education is, is preparing young people for the labour market and for adult life more generally. In both systems, we see that uh, high stakes exams are seen as limiting young people's skill development. And we're seeing some, some developments there in, in Ireland around the senior cycle. We see two potential for learning in, in, from other systems. Uh, the DASH programme was spoken of highly by stakeholders both in Ireland and in Northern Ireland, mostly because of the targeted nature of the supports, the holistic nature of those supports and, and the way in which uh, kind of funding is linked to uh, planning. And finally, uh, stakeholders were positive about the potential for increased cross-border collaboration. As the Taoiseach highlighted, top-down mandates are unlikely to be successful. We really need structures and frameworks that are going to facilitate cooperation around areas that matter to stakeholders. And there certainly seem to be common challenges and potential for mutual learning, in particular around tackling educational disadvantage and ensuring the full inclusion of students with special educational needs. Thank you very much. Great, thank you uh, so much, Emer, and thanks so much, Anne, as well. Uh, huge amount of material uh, covered, obviously a huge amount in the report, and uh, a huge amount covered uh, by the two of you there. So uh, lots of food for thought. And um, I want to move on now quickly to the, the next um, 
part of our discussion. Um, so delighted to say we have three excellent panelists uh, who are going to respond uh, to the paper. So firstly, Professor Terry Scott, we've heard from Terry already, who's Pro Vice Chancellor uh, of Ulster University. Uh, also then uh, Professor Anne Looney and Anne, as many of you will know, Executive Dean at the Dublin City University Institute of Education. And we're also joined by Peter Osborne, uh, who currently is Chair of the Centre for Cross uh, Border uh, Studies, uh, but also Board Member of the Integrated Education Fund. So we're going to get three sort of interesting perspectives on the work that's just been presented uh, in no particular order. Um, maybe we'll, we'll uh, ask Terry uh, to go first. And uh, again, if some of the authors, I think, are, are rejoining us on the on the screen as well, we'll have some time for discussion um, after um, all, all this. So some of the authors might want to respond to some of the comments that have been made and, and vice versa. And as I said, hopefully we'll have a good and, and lively discussion. So with that, uh, Terry, it's a, it's a pleasure. I'll, I'll, Pleasure to welcome you to the SRI, even though it's, it's, it's virtual, it's still uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. So we'll, we'll look forward to your comments. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Alan, for, for the introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm using a few slides that I, I, I worked through and uh, look forward to the opportunity for, for, for the Q&A. Uh, this morning, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, two aspects of the report findings very quickly to give an insight and uh, some of the points that uh, Anna and Eamon have, have uh, addressed. The point that research indicates the limited formal cross-border and the Taoiseach pulled this point as well and the north-south links are ad hoc I think that just in the previous presentations both these points were pulled out of the excellent report really comprehensive uh, really it, it very much enjoyed uh, uh, going through the report and so much follow-up that will be required so this morning's uh, webinar is really uh, suppose a, a starting point for us in terms of the the willingness to engage, uh, I think that's very evident from the, from the interest in the seminar and the uptake in terms of those stakeholders that wanted to engage uh, with the research. Three little cameos that I want to, to focus on, and I suppose I gave you a, a preview of that, uh, is that uh, the opportunities for enhanced North-South collaboration and bearing in mind that you know, these things don't happen overnight. And two examples that I'm going to choose of cross-border collaboration, which demonstrate both the, the, the methodology and the importance of uh, a longer term commitment. Um, and uh, as, as the previous speakers have said, it does require a champion, it does require a common vision. So two little uh, short examples that I'm going to uh, take you through in terms of collaboration that Ulster University has with uh, IT Sligo and Letterkenny and now Atlantic Technological University, which I think are uh, opportunities for others to build on uh, before moving to speak very briefly about cross-border apprentice provision and the opportunities. So the, the context that has been set for the report uh, in terms of what and how we deliver our education system and uh, not surprisingly, I'm focusing on the sort of further and higher education part of, of the work. But I think what is important for all of us is how the pandemic has transformed the world of work and the delivery of education, but particularly in terms of the world of work, because the education uh, system is delivering the, the skills for the world of work and for citizens to contribute to society. And you know, what is important and what's changed dramatically in the last couple of years since the onset of the pandemic is workforce mobility and uh, remote and hybrid working and changing and emerging skills needs and skills gaps. So some areas have, have grown, some other have contracted and the importance of the education system, particularly at the further and higher end to be able to respond with agility to meet those skills needs or else we will lose the investment uh, and it will be mobile and go elsewhere. So the first example that I would like to take you to is one that has been on, on the books for some time. Uh, we maybe even have some of the uh, 
attendees at, at this event this morning who've gone through this program, the MSc Leadership and Innovation in Public Sector. And I think the, the title of, of this program actually sums up the, the focus of one of the outcomes uh, the, and the recommendations in the report. You know, there has been great leadership and innovation in the public sector. And I think, you know, going back to the the, the seminal work by, by Whitaker, by George Quigley, that Alan uh, referred to uh, in his opening remarks. You know, so many individuals at uh, senior levels in both jurisdictions uh, have been uh, key to getting us to where we are today. And this program is not an exception. So this is a joint award uh, by Letterkenny and Ulster, uh, now ATU. The students on this program are joint, uh, are civil servants from both jurisdictions. So immediately you can see that the benefits of bringing the, the two cohorts of senior staff together in both jurisdictions, the action learning approach that is used, and uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with a block teaching model uh, where uh, the, the sort of week long and, and weekend teaching with residential delivery. Uh, it's basically 50-50 in terms of the split um, the 20 places each year, uh, and th th this will be you know, half north and south, and uh, basically the work is shared between the two universities. So the one thing that uh, is really uh, demonstrated for me, and you know, I was aware of this program when it was being developed in 2003, and then coming back and looking at it most recently, is the phenomenal positive feedback from students uh, and, and alumni on this program and the long lasting relationships of the people uh, on this program. So, you know, the, we've only 20 places uh, funded on this course annually, but there is an opportunity to expand that and explore other opportunities for the model that is used. Because as the teacher said, it's the outcome that you want to achieve and not have the, you know, get tied up on, on, on governance. So where you have a mutual a desire to have something, uh, a joint program where both institutions will jointly accredit it. And uh, that takes huge work and huge commitment from a quality perspective and to ensure that the, the both uh, credit transfer systems are, are, are comparable. And this is one of the feedback that I have from the staff that developed the program is that this takes time to do it. And it took you know, two years in the development. And in 2017, the course went through a complete re-evaludation with, with external uh, review. Uh, the second example that I want to uh, speak to is quite different because it's an undergraduate program uh, and therefore targeting a different type of cohort of individuals at a different stage in their career. So back in 2016, this program was launched jointly uh, building on the strengths and synergies of the Univer Ulster University and IT Sligo. Uh, and IT Sligo is the leader in, in Ireland in online provision with the by a significant uh, lead in terms of the, the level of program, the expanse across different disciplines. And the big challenge here was to ensure that the, the module structure within the program was uh, accredited and aligned to both credit transfer systems. And this is something that is particularly important uh, in, for, for students that are going to be taking uh, components of a course and uh, we have to recognize that when people are doing part-time study, that they may need to step back from part-time study. Uh, and the ability to finish this within a, a four-year system uh, may be impacted on, on work and family commitments. So the one thing that's exciting about this program, it's different. It's an online program. And the, the practical work is undertaken by the students remotely because they are working within the pharma sector and then also uh, supplemented by intensive uh, campus workshops. The students have grown steadily um, over the, the five years to having 100 students now enrolled. And when you look at the, the outcomes for the, the first cohort of graduates in 1920 and, for, and 2021 academic years, the significant number of students achieving uh, outstanding uh, outcomes of first class honours degrees gives uh, an indication of the, the value and the commitment you know, of the students, the lecturers and their employers in supporting them. So, and you see there that there's a satisfaction rate of, of 100% uh, and 90% respectively in, in the National Student Survey. This is so important in helping us to build on, on these programmes. Uh, I then want to move to, to speak 
to uh, and give some insights to degree level apprenticeships. Now, in Northern Ireland, the degree apprenticeships are funded through the Department for the Economy and, uh, and with employer contribution. Now, traditionally, we often think about uh, apprenticeships being at a pre-degree or a, a sort of post-FE uh, level, you know, where students would complete uh, in the South, they would complete uh, their second level education and then go into an apprenticeship. Uh, before progressing with the degree, but uh, across Europe uh, and in, in Australia, uh, in, in the last 10 years, there's been a move to have degree level apprenticeships and the same model applies. Basically, the students will earn as they learn. Uh, and the important uh, development here is that the students are sponsored by their employer. So in Ulster, we launched in 1516 uh, with 14 students on a program uh, on business technology. Uh, today, we have 498 degree apprenticeships across 13 programs. Now those programs, we could, we could run uh, you know, three times that because there's huge demand from employers. And at the moment, you know, we are constrained by the, the level of funding that we have from the Department for the Economy. The Department of the Economy have given a commitment to growing uh, apprenticeship provision right through from, from level three, four, five, and six. Uh, but you know, with the, and this is where the, the point that the Taoiseach made with the political mandate, with the, uh, depending on how this will play out in the next, uh, in the next few weeks and months, uh, as to how uh, the Department of the Economy will be able to support this. Uh, before I speak to the opportunities for cross-border, I just want to uh, focus briefly on, on the benefits. Uh, this report has identified the huge challenge that we have in uh, Northern Ireland and in the South of tackling disadvantage and overcoming barriers to participation. Apprentice provision makes that easier for students because they don't have the same financial outlay and commitment. They have sponsors, coaches, mentors, both from the employer and from their academic institution. And that academic institution could be a university, but could also be a further education college. So we've got this huge employer commitment to supporting an individual, if you like, in, in, in a long recruitment process, which means that they will have the financial support and the mentorship and support. The big value for us is that we're seeing it addressing the skills pipeline. The model of an apprenticeship creates a sort of a problem solving approach where students are in the workplace from get go and that nurtures a creativity and independent thinking. Now, the opportunities for us are on cross border mobility and the opportunities bring also uh, challenges because if a student is based in a company in Northern Ireland, then there are limits to how they can go when the funding comes from the, the Northern Ireland executive. Uh, so those are the areas where we would be keen to see uh, a cross-border mobility on apprenticeships and also the opportunity for cross-border public sector apprenticeships and Department for the Economy have uh, recently announced a commitment to roll out public sector apprenticeships for care leavers. And just to close, uh, just to give you a sight of the UU degree apprenticeships, and you see that we've moved into master's programs as well and uh, look forward to uh, engaging with the participants this morning. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Terry. I have to say I've learned a huge amount uh, from your presentation. Uh, fantastic just to hear the actual sort of, you know, practical details of the sort of collaborations, collaborations that we're, we're talking about today. So th thanks so much for that. Um, get in contact. We're going to go till about noon. Uh, so I want to make sure we, we get um, the panel is in and hopefully have a little bit of time uh, for some Q&A. Uh, so with that, uh, Anne, can I uh, ask you, uh, to, I, I feel slightly bad, I always think you, you, you have participated in a lot of ESRI right? <laughs> so it's always a pleasure to have you. So we keep exploiting your expertise, so hopefully we can do it today and for many years into the future. But anyway, it's great to see you again, Anne. Uh, and you, Alan, now always happy to be exploited by the ESRI, but obviously having a long relationship uh, going back to my days in working in the NCCA with the, with the team at ESRI and, and producing research that really shaped education policy. So congratulations again to the team behind 
behind this study. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so I don't know whether that means everyone breathes out or goes and gets a cup of coffee, but instead I, I'm going to structure my, my comments a bit like the Taoiseach, I'm going to go with threes. I have three surprises, uh, three things that surprised me in the study that I, I want to comment on, three observations on the findings, and then I couldn't come up with three pieces that were missing. So I'm just going to go with two, although I did notice a couple of suggestions in the Q&A for further research. And I think there's, there's, I think people who are on the call will have some suggestions of how you might break down data further and what else, else might, might, need, might need to be done. And I'm making those observations as somebody who works in higher education uh, with a real interest in the articulation with further education but who previously worked in the school sector and would have worked quite closely with colleagues in Northern Ireland at different stages of those projects. And, and I suppose that's my, my, first, my first surprise is that this is the first systematic study comparing the systems North and South. I, to be honest, I, I think it was an assumption in the background that I'm sure everybody knows there's plenty of data, and but actually bringing it all together and looking at the entire um, system as a whole, the fact that that hadn't been done before, it was it was my first surprise. And I think the Taoiseach drew attention to that in his opening remarks also, that it is the first study and, and part of, I, I think, an extremely positive outcome from the Shared Island partnership with, um, with the SRI that this work has been, has been done. Um, because it seems such an obvious omission. Um, I work with the OECD also when we conduct reviews of education systems and we look at um, partner systems or benchmark systems for them. But the fact that we share an island with another system um, that has evolved differently, um, but that, that we never actually researched uh, or did a systematic review of, of the connections and the differences, I think is a, is a gap. So it's really timely that, that's, that that has been done and congratulations to everybody. I suspect looking at the Q&A that it's the first of a series and there's going to be more of these because there are certainly more areas for development and Terry has articulated a few of them there that we could look at in terms of apprenticeships. The second thing that surprised me was about further education and training. I know that when back in the day when I worked with the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, we would meet colleagues from the equivalent organization in Northern Ireland, the Council for Curriculum um, Examinations and, and Assessment in Northern Ireland. And I, I always had a clear sense that the further education and training sector and vocational education more broadly was far was far stronger in Northern Ireland. It was certainly presented as being a strength of the system coming out of its historical, um, the historical relationship with, with big heavy industry, manuf the kind of manufacturing industries that gave rise to strong vocational systems across Europe. And what's been really surprising is to hear data now that would say that the level of post-secondary engagement in Ireland is actually higher than in Northern Ireland. And to look at in the report, the critiques around the, 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 the fact that within Ireland now, further education is undergoing a revival. It's a major strategic initiative around joined up policy in further education, a big focus on pathways. I mean, the Taoiseach mentioned that as well. And that a sense in the report that in Northern Ireland, it may well be the forgotten sector, while there is a strategy around it, because some of the individual colleges, and indeed Terry led one of them, are so strong in the individual colleges themselves are so strong that actually there's quite a lot of competition between the, the further education institutions in Northern Ireland, and it isn't seen itself as a system. And then it's difficult to articulate that into the broader education system. So that really, that was my second surprise. And my, my third one was both a surprise and a disappointment. There's a, there's a great statement in the, um, in the report, um, one of those headline grabbers that simply says intergenerational educational mobility is considerably lower in Northern Ireland than in Ireland. And that, that is broken down into terms of outcomes and in terms of expectations. And I think I found that both surprising given the island's cultural focus on education, that, um, con that, that the expectations from particular groups in Northern Ireland were so much lower than other groups in Northern Ireland and than, in, than, in, than in Ireland. But it would be concerning from a policymaker's perspective 
because education is so grounded on the promise of upward mobility, whether it's a better salary, whether it's a better job, whether it's human flourishing, whether it's more skilled. There is a promise when you send a child to school that this is going to be good for the child. They are going to succeed. They're going to thrive. And it's a very powerful promise. That's not if that's not being delivered and if it's not visible, particularly in communities who don't have a history of engagement in education, then that is a real political and policy challenge. So they were my three surprises. My three observations. I want to go first to early childhood education, which which gets a little uh, small treatment in the report, um, uh, Emer and Anne. But nonetheless, I thought you pulled out two really interesting points. The first is that it's a very clear system where in, in Ireland, we've developed early childhood education recently informed by a European model, which would see children engaging in early childhood education. That's the, the early childhood education provided by the state at a very young age. So from two years, eight months, I think it is in Ireland, where and with a focus on the holistic development of the child, and in Northern Ireland, the, the, the preschool, and that's, that title is not insignificant, with a focus on school readiness. So <clears throat> these, these systems are developing in quite different ways now for our very youngest children. And we know that the foundations of social mobility are in early childhood. And so I think that significant difference will, is an area where, given that the Irish system is quite new, there could be areas for cooperation, mutual areas of research, mutual areas for engagement. Ireland is currently developing its, its, its workforce in early childhood education and just developing a, a strong research base there. And I think it's an area where there could be cooperation. Interesting, too, was the data that you presented on page 28 about the fact that when, the ch when children come into primary school in both jurisdictions, the differences observed by teachers or measured in screening tests are actually minimal. The children are starting out with actually some differences when you control for maternal education, which is the single biggest, single biggest factor. But when you control for maternal education, actually there's quite a lot in common when they start but as they move through the systems, the inequalities really cement. So I thought that early childhood was an area that, that, that you presented some interesting findings on. I think it was notable in the report what was observed about the, the DESH strategy in, in Ireland, the, the strategy to address educational disadvantage. And yes, to colleagues who have observed, there are failures in the disadvantage um, strategy. Someone has mentioned um, Irish travellers, for example, as a significant group in Irish education that continue to uh, be excluded, to underperform, and we're not getting it right for, for travellers. But nonetheless, the DESH success, which is documented in the report, is actually a global success. It's, it's actually something that you get, you notice globally if you attend international seminars on closing the achievement gap. If you read research reports, the, the, the success of the DESH strategy on the island and in, in Ireland has been, has been is, is, is seen as a great success of Irish education. And, and it's, its features, it's targeted, the political leadership, the alignment, so all the pieces of the system joined up over an extended period of time, the role of research. But for the DESH strategy to deliver over a period of time, such a long period of time, required a level of political, with a small p and a large p, buy-in to, um, to the policies of DESH that had to, had to move through various cycles of government. And, and that political stability allowed for that policy to, to deliver. And it's so notable that in Northern Ireland, the absence of that stability means that putting those longer term um, policies in place that require stick with policy goals are very challenging and I, I, I think while there are lessons that can be learned from the DESH success in Northern Ireland I think one of the context contextual factors is that for that kind of intergenerational policy success it requires a level of political stability that I think is, is still a, a way in, in Northern Ireland and the last observation I'd make is about pathways and uh, 
we, we, we talk about pathways and progression that Taoiseach did also from post-secondary routes from further education into higher education. But I think there is huge potential and it's flagged in Terry's comments about pathways that would see students moving across the border um, and moving across the island, across different institutions as we develop a technological university sector, sector a more mature, mature further education sector um, in, in, in Ireland. I think there is great possibilities for more pathways. And I think that would be to the benefit of both systems and the policy as a, as, as a whole. My two kind of gaps are um, around, oh, sorry, just one observation, seeing a point coming in in the chat, in terms of the, the surprise around intergenerational mobility and education. I mean, you point in your report, Emer, to the persistence of academic selection at 11 and 12 in Northern Ireland, which is a policy erratic, uh, very few systems do that kind of um, selection now. It is the only system in the United Kingdom that does that kind of selection now. Researchers within Northern Ireland have pointed to the, the challenges and the consequences of it. And it's clear from your, your own qualitative engagement that you had similar um, consensus in the comments back from your discussions. But again, the political leadership to address that particular challenge um, is is something that I think still escapes still escapes Northern Ireland, and the consequences of that are both historic, continuing, and um, are certainly costing uh, Northern Ireland in terms of cohesion and in terms of economic economic development. I can say that now, as somebody who works in an academic setting, if I was working in a policy setting, I'd probably be slightly more diplomatic in my language. But I think as a researcher, it just is so glaring. You you have to you have to say it. What was missing? Well, I know teachers got a look in in terms of Scotans, and as a member of the Standing Committee of Teacher Education North and South, it is a it is a it is the little engine who could, in terms of a small project that has lasted. And Peter and the Centre for Cross Border Studies and, and his predecessors in that centre have been central to keeping that going. But I thought that teachers and teaching as a theme was something that was missing in the report. Northern Ireland and Ireland share something in common in respect of teaching. And that is, while we have lots of issues around teacher supply, shortage of maths and science teachers, et cetera, we, have, we still have, we're one of the few parts of the world that has competitive entry for teacher education. There are more people want to be teachers than there are places available to train them within universities. We also have, North and South, committed to our teacher education being in higher education institutions, as opposed to say England, for example, which has a school-led model now. So we've committed research-based teacher education and teaching continues to be north and south, despite the challenges around low pay and, and accommodation, but continues to be regarded as a high, a high status profession and people have a lot of trust in teachers. I've said before, I think it is our all island advantage I think that exploiting that fact, which is, which is, a, a, which is that feature of the system, which is lost in other jurisdictions, even close by to us, where you cannot, you can, where, where there are vacancies in teacher education programs, I think that's something we should be looking at and thinking about as an all island resource. I think it's one of the reasons in Northern Ireland why you don't see a huge gap. In, uh, in the PISA data at 15 is because the students are still in school and while they're in school, the teachers are doing a great job with them. It's when they move out of school because they don't see any value in the qualifications that you really start getting the, the, the gaps in, in advantage. So my, my, pitch is for, my pitch is for more work on teachers north and south. And the last piece that's missing, but I know why it is missing, is that you didn't really discuss the political context of education in Northern Ireland. And obviously the historical, linguistic and religious factors shaping the system and driving um, some of the persistent inequalities and the kind of some of the peculiarities of the system. I think um, I know why you didn't, but I think in the chat and in the questions and answers that you can see coming up, Others here are pointing to those uh, features of the system. Um, and there, there are features in the South. We have peculiarities in Ireland also. But I think there's probably another paper to be done 
about the consequences of that. And some of that has been well documented in the reports on the transfer test. And we'd expect to see something similar in the independent review of education that I think has been, was commissioned by the, by the Northern Ireland government. So there are my three surprises, three observations, and, and, uh, and two suggestions for what might come next. Thank you, Alan. Great, thanks so much. Uh... And as ever, you didn't disappoint. And uh, again, lot, lot, lots of food for thought and uh, some uh, mildly controversial points. Uh, so Peter, you've been waiting patiently uh, to, to, to have your say. Uh, so the good thing about going uh, towards the end is you, is you can stray into some of the points that Anne and, and Terry uh, has made as well. So uh, again, pleasure to welcome you to the, the Institute. Thanks so much for coming along. We we'll look forward to your comments. Thanks very much, Alan. And uh, yeah, I don't have slides because I do want to stray into some of the areas that have already been mentioned. And I have to say, as a, a working class lad brought up in a housing estate in Belfast who failed my transfer test, it's absolutely appropriate that I follow two professors and I, I will touch on transfer test uh, and some of the other issues that have been mentioned. Can I first of all say thank you to the Institute uh, for hosting the event. I think it's a really important event and I suspect other events are going to follow out of this because the topic is so critical as well, but also for producing what is a quality uh, piece of research with a great clarity around some of the issues that it explores and it provides all of us interested in this topic with so much uh, data and information that we can take it into all other walks of of uh, er, er, policy areas that we're involved with. It's a super piece of, of research. Can I, can I also thank the Shared Island Unit for facilitating and supporting that research? I'm going to say something that is uh, a really obvious thing to say, but it's important to say it sometimes. This island has always been shared, and this island always will be shared. It may be done in different ways, and I'm not stressed straying into the politics of the situation but sometimes we haven't shared this island very well like in the 1920s and the 1970s and 50 and 100 years on from those decades and the 2020s now it is really appropriate that we start to explore how we share this island better and that does come back to some things that are mentioned in this report and has been, have been mentioned so far uh, it does come back to mutual interest and mutual benefit and where there are areas of policy where it is of interest and benefit to people on this island, wherever they may live, it is important that we explore that and we make life better for everyone. That does not mean diluting anybody's background or culture or identity uh, or their politics. It just means making life better for people on either side of the border. And it's an important contribution to that debate uh, with this paper. I'm not going to cover uh, a number of aspects of what has been said by the Tisha, by Anne or Terry, but I do want to stray into uh, some areas. And I think it's inevitable when we look at this sort of report that we, we concentrate on areas that need to improve. But it's also important to say that there are a lot of good practice, there's a lot of good practice happening in Northern Ireland and in Southern Ireland. Uh, around education, and they go under the radar sometimes when we look at reports like this, because it, it is also relevant and appropriate that we look at things that need to improve. A quotation occurred to me as I read the report uh, at almost every section, it's a quotation I would use sometimes, and everybody here will be very familiar with it, a quotation from an educationist called Sidney Harris, who said, education is about turning mirrors into windows. And what he meant by that, I think was that for young people, it is about uh, helping them not to look at the immediate and what's around them and who they are now, but to look through the window at where they might be, uh, how they might achieve their ambitions, the vision for themselves and for their communities and for their regions in the future. And what's very clear from this report is that on at least two levels, uh, we're not fulfilling that quotation. Uh, we are letting down our young people, many of them, uh, who are caught in systemic and generational education poverty. These are young people who are not able to see through the window at a bright future where they have ambition uh, that uh, they might otherwise have. They are caught in a trap where uh, some of the statistics that I'll come back to in a moment show uh, that there is a generational issue, especially in the North, but also to an extent in the South. 
And the second uh, area where I think we're, we're not fulfilling that quotation is around the systems and structures generally. And I notice some comment on this in the chat function as well. Certainly in the North, uh, I think we uh, have, we're looking in the mirror and we're seeing some of our ancestors. We're, we're hearing what the ancestral voices say to us far too often. And that is about continuing to replicate and sustain structures and education that we have had for a century and a half, if not more. And I'm talking in particular uh, about the uh, issue of segregation within our education system. And I'll uh, touch on that uh, a little bit uh, as well as we go through briefly. I know I don't have that much time. But in terms of the education poverty, one of the statistics that struck me, it's one of those things that if you ask me about this in five or 10 years time, I suspect I'll still be able to quote these actual figures. Uh, I think the report says that if, of those parents who did not go to further or higher education, in Northern Ireland, 21% of their children now go to further and higher education. In the South, the figure is 53%. That's an incredible difference between the North and the South. And it does reflect a generation and another generation and probably another generation who are stuck in that cycle of education poverty. Because while 21% in, in the North is really, is, is good for those 21%, what it also says is four out of five uh, children and young people, 80%, uh, are not going on to further and higher education of those whose parents uh, didn't go to further and higher education. And that is far too high a statistic. And um, I, I take uh, Terry's point about using diplomatic language. Sometimes we, we need to not use diplomatic language. That is a terrible indictment of higher education system in the North, but to a lesser extent in the South, is letting down people from um, that sort of background where there is uh, lack of educational uh, uh, attainment in, in parent, uh, in their, with their parents, but also from within communities. And I'll speak from some personal experience. I failed my 11 plus. Uh, I came from a working class background. I was brought up in a housing estate. Let me tell you, every single pupil in my class failed their 11 plus. 30 odd of us failed, every one of us. So in a way, I didn't fail, the system failed me and the system failed my peers in that class. Now I find other avenues and other ways because the system was telling me, I, the Taoiseach's absolutely right about the uh, uh, earnings as a bricklayer, but the system was telling us, you know your place, go and be a bricklayer, go and be a taxi driver, go and be a care assistant or a nurse, go and be a plumber. Don't think about being a professional person or having input into seminars and events like this, because that's not your place. It's a terrible indictment of the system that we have. And there needs to be a serious look by policymakers that the consequence of carrying on with systemic discrimination against working class children from both Protestant and Catholic backgrounds, whenever that's the outcome. How much has our society lost by having those 30 odd, very talented young people not being able to fulfill their potential because of the system? Whenever I chaired the Community Relations Council, and we, we, we produced a Peace Monitor report in, I think, 2014, and highlighted education underachievement, especially amongst boys within Protestant and Catholic communities. The response I got when I suggested one of the answers was greater investment based on free school meals was an incredibly negative response uh, from some people uh, in policymaking terms. Are we really serious about wanting to deal with the issue, not about the transfer test as a mechanism, deal with the issue of how some people are excluded. There are examples of good practice. I think that's been referred to in terms of the equality of opportunity in schools in the South. There are uh, examples of good practice in the North as well, uh, uh, around the higher education strategy and cross-border mobility. And can I say what a pleasure it is to recently take over chair of the Centre for Cross-Border Studies and the fact that those examples of good practice have been mentioned around Scotland's and Universities Ireland. But it's really important also to say why they're good practice. They're not add-ons with those organisations. Those organisations want to do this work north and south. They can see the benefits and it is resourced adequately in order to have the dialogues and conversations, come up with the ideas and uh, make some things happen. We need more of that across the education sector and across other sectors as well. 
Let me mention briefly a second uh, thing that occurred to me. It's going to touch on slightly what Terry has, has touched on around segregation. We have a system in Northern Ireland where 7% of children are educated and developed together in the same classroom, Protestants and Catholics. In the Catholic maintained sector, the official statistics show 1% of students are Protestant, the rest are Catholic by and large. In the uh, control sector, 7% are Catholic, the rest are Protestants by and large. And then we wonder as a society, why do we not know each other terribly well? Why do most people like me only talk to somebody from the other side of the community when we're 18 and go to university? Why do we play separate sports? Why do we not actually understand? Why do we not have good relationships? Well, the systemic issue around how our education system is segregated is an example of that. It costs about £100 million pounds a year uh, directly in terms of the duplication. The latest statistics I've seen from the Ulster University and their excellent Transforming Education series. And then listen to this. We spend maybe £200 million a year, maybe more, actually getting the children and young people to come together for a few hours or a day or two during the year in order to compensate for the segregation and the £100 million pounds plus that is spent in the duplication. How crazy is that system? We also spend £89 million pounds a year busing children to schools not their closest in order to be schooled with co-religionists. And listen to this, that costs a hundred and uh, that leads to 130 million miles of travel by buses in order to make to get those children to other schools. An absolutely crazy system. Or you look at the isolated pairs research from Ulster University. I'd encourage you to do that. Protestant and Catholic school within a mile of each other. That's a short hand for controlled and maintained. Within a mile of each other in 32 villages, 64 schools. Of those 32 villages, 26 have schools that are below the threshold for sustainability. What's the consequence? When that school closes, it won't be to unite the two schools in an integrated school. It will be how do we bus those children to the nearest school with co-religionists, five miles away, 10 miles away, 20 miles away. And when one of those schools closes within 20 years, my prediction will be, as we've seen in the past, that village becomes a single identity village really detrimental to the peace process and building a positive peace in Northern Ireland rather than a negative peace where there's an absence of violence, but we still don't have a great deal of contact uh, with each other. I think there's an issue which we'd need explored further about how our young people are leaving uh, to go to university uh, across the water. It's not necessarily a bad thing uh, because they will learn new things. And frankly, it's what happens with young people anywhere. They tend to move towards the bigger populations uh, anyway, whether it's on the island of Ireland in the north or uh, moving across uh, the water. I think there is more research done in that. The research especially is about how we bring them back into what is more likely they'll come back if they come back into a 21st century European socially progressive region or island. Let me make briefly six asks. First ask, is that we do need to have serious scoping and analysis about what makes cross-border cooperation work and collaboration work well. From the point of view of the Centre for Cross-Border Studies, it's something that is so important. Our experience is it's about motivation, uh, the organisations wanting to do it and not having it as a little add-on to their activities, but a really important core part of what they do. The departments need to remove whatever technical or administrative barriers there are to that collaboration. And we do need more research east-west, west-east, as well as north-south, south-north. I think the issues around education poverty, as I'll call it, are really clear. And there needs to be real commitment, which does need to be political. But please also make sure there are avenues for civil society to be involved in that debate of how we tackle those generational issues, because civil society tends to be a lot further ahead very often than uh, political society. I would suggest that the authors in the excellent presentations that made uh, very quickly make a similar presentation to the, um, to the, uh, the body that has been asked to look at uh, education in the North, the Independent Review of Education, and also make the presentation to the Education Committee in the Assembly if and when it gets up and running. And finally, Please, it is time that the Fiscal Council looked at the cost of education in Northern Ireland in a similar way to they're doing as they're doing in the health service 
uh, to explore what it actually costs to have a segregated system, what it costs to be so, uh, to leave so many of our young people behind who fail the transfer test and don't get adequate support to fulfill their potential and make some suggestions about how the, how the money saved in both of those areas can be reinvested into the education system to make it even better than the, in many ways, good education system it is. Apologies if we run over time. No, no, no problem at all, uh, Peter, and thanks so much uh, for, for those uh, ref reflective points. Um, I'm, I'm tempted, actually, I, I'm tempted, I'm going to ask you two blunt questions, uh, if, I, if I may, because uh, they were prompted uh, in your remarks. Now, partly, you, you mentioned the Fiscal Council, uh, and I just happen to be a member of the Fiscal Council, and uh, in the context of education in, in Northern Ireland and, and segregation, a point that has been made uh, to us is that, of course, a segregated system costs more, uh, but people want this. OK, it's a choice that Northern Ireland is, is making. And I suppose the question I'm, I'm, I'm going to put, and I genuinely don't know the answer to this, is while sort of groups like this might talk about segregated education as being a, a, a real problem, the fact that it persists suggests either there's some like phenomenal rigidity, you know, to bring about change, or there's a constituency who still think this is a really good idea. So I'm just wondering, I mean, if, where is Northern Ireland in, in terms of rethinking um, integrated education and by, and by that I mean the sort of you know the, the broad population? Very good question. Um, the, the, repeatedly uh, polls will show that 70% plus of people want to send their, their, their children to schools where they're educated together with other people from other sides of the community uh, where children learn and develop together in the same classroom. So whether it is life and time surveys or lucid talk polls or uh, I think Sky, I think, did a, a poll as well. They repeatedly show the same thing. 70 to 80 percent of parents want their children educated together. With, if I put my uh, IEF hat on, uh, the uh, polls that we would conduct with people will show the same thing. And whenever there are parental ballots in schools, uh, parental ballot happens if 20 percent of parents want their school to explore integration. And then when those ballots are held, consistently 70 to 100 percent well 60 odd to 100 percent of those parents and schools will vote yes and that's part of the reason why you see so many uh, schools now transforming transferring into becoming integrated the issue is uh, and by the way in the uh, uh, when open days are held uh, there is huge demand for many of the integrated schools that exist the issue is that there aren't enough of them and the parents don't have that option within driving distance of their home to send their children to it. And the area planning model, which I hope is going to be uh, 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 explored after the integrated education bill went through a few weeks ago, uh, does tend to uh, be very conservative about sustaining the existing uh, schools that are there. Uh, so those, ch those parents who want to send their children to integrated schools don't really have the option to do that. Uh, it's a really difficult thing, and I understand the difficulty of changing a system that has been here for 150 years, essentially, in slightly different ways, and certainly after the 1920s and 1930s, but it is something that we do need to look, because this is about normalising the education experience for our children. It is abnormal to go to school, by and large, with co-religionists and not actually uh, have access to people from the other side of the community until you're 18. That's abnormal, and we are... We are continuing to uh, sustain that uh, education system, partly because it's too difficult to change. We need a 20, 30, 40 year roadmap that says, here's how we're going to change it. Starting off, by the way, we talked about uh, teacher training, starting off by not having two separate teacher training colleges for adults who by and large get trained how to be teachers with co-religionists. You wouldn't do that for any other profession. Imagine if I said, do you want to be a doctor, but do you want to cure Protestants or Catholics? Because depending on which you want to cure, you're going to go to the uh, education college that trains you to do that. What a lot of nonsense that would be, similar in education.
Thanks for that, Peter. Uh, now, amazingly, we're, we're, we're kind of up against time and uh, I feel really bad. No, don't you apologize, Peter. Uh, everybody who's participated is guilty uh, of, of this. Um, I feel bad in the sense that we, we won't have got to uh, many of the questions that were raised, but actually I think some of the issues, uh, fortunately, people did um, on, on, on the panel uh, talk about some of the, these issues and there's been a good and lively uh, discussion on the chat function. So hopefully those issues have been uh, have been dealt with. I'm just, uh, Adele and Seamus, I'm just wondering if either of you would like to make any sort of uh, concluding remarks, given that you were part, part of the team who sweated for months over this, this study. Um, so either Seamus or Adele. Sure, maybe I'll, I'll just go very briefly. I just want to say thanks very much to all the panelists. I think they raised a huge number of, of questions and avenues for, for future work. A lot of the, the other suggestions in the Q&A um, about looking at you know, students from, from other types of backgrounds, travellers and, and, and so on, I suppose I would just go back to the fact that this is the first study that kind of systematically compares the two systems from primary to higher education. Um, we, I think we all the authors would accept all of the comments and, and suggestions that were made. I think they're all avenues for future work. So I would sort of hopefully see this as the, the first report in, 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 a, in a wider space. And, and just to say, Anne, you had some comments around uh, early childcare. There's actually going to be a new study on that um, as part of this research program this year. So uh, watch this space. Very good. And Seamus? Yeah, I'd just like to say that, again, thanks to everyone. And uh, I was particularly struck by Peter's comments because I also, uh, from working class area in the north, I also failed the transfer test. And I can't be sure that everyone else in my class did, but uh, I would say certainly over 90% uh, also failed. Uh, and I think this is one of the issues that, uh, that, that the research really has highlighted is actually looking at the, uh, the, the, the disadvantage, the role of disadvantage in terms of educational outcomes. I think we can't ignore the, the elephant in the room in terms of the transfer test and the role that that plays within the North, particularly now we have a system where you cannot participate in the transfer test if, because it requires private tuition now to actually uh, to do the transfer test, which is very costly. And, and I, I think that's creating additional barriers again to children from, from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. So uh, I, I was particularly struck uh, by, by, by Peter's uh, comments. And I just does, I thought I'd make that point. Great. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that, Seamus. Uh, now, unfortunately, as I said, we, we, we do have to bring things uh, to a close, but it, it has been a fantastic uh, event. And so sincere thanks to everybody uh, who has been involved. Peter, you made the point there that um, I, I think there is enough material that, that a, a sort of a, a, another session at, at, at some point uh, and in some place would be a great idea. Uh, I noticed we did have some members of the Oireachtas uh, logged, logged on today. Uh, I think that the members of the assembly are probably otherwise occupied at the moment. I'm sure they're out knocking on doors rather than sitting, uh, listening to uh, ESRI webinars. Uh, but certainly uh, in the not too distant future, it would be great as you suggested to do something like a, an appearance before the education committee uh, in Northern Ireland or, or maybe, uh, Terry, if uh, you'd be willing to facilitate maybe some sort of events at UU or something like that. But clearly there's a, a huge amount of material to be discussed and a huge amount of interest uh, as well in these issues. So I think a, uh, another run through uh, would be very, very useful uh, at some stage. So with that, I'm just going to thank everybody once again uh, and wish you all a very uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>